And I've been farming for over 30 years uh, full time. I've never done anything but farm since I was big enough to get in a tractor seat. You know, if you look at your, your input, your cost, and, and you just, you feel like you're beating your head against the wall, that, that there's not a, an opportunity to make a profit, that, you know, you look at cover crops and soil health and, 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 and a systems approach, and you have an open mind to say that there might be something different than what you've been doing. That, that this, this, this CIG has opened our eyes. The USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, has for some years been awarding conservation innovation grants. We call them CIGs. CIGs are designed by the NRCS to take innovative ideas and show how they work on private farms and ranches. This process involves some farming, some science and a great deal of outreach. One of the biggest things that I think this, this SIG grant has, has done for me is to open my eyes and see that, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about plant health, but we need to be looking at soil health, you know. And so we begin to say, well, there's more than six inches of soil too. We got to look at the whole soil profile. So it's just changing all the way that we were thinking. Farmers John McInnes, Jason Carter, Alan Gaddy, Sonny Price, and Carl Coleman provided 59 acres of land in the coastal plain soils of South Carolina. These fields were our first attempt to understand what happens to soils when they're consistently and diversely cover cropped. I've learned so much from watching these fields, but the process has changed not just me, but each of the five farmers in whose fields I've worked. We used to have to lime every other year. Now we weren't putting out a full ton. We were variable rate applying according to what the soil samples called for, but here we are at uh, the CIG field. Hasn't had any lime on it in six years now, and the pH is stabilized, and I think it's still averaging in the six. It's probably close to 6.5. Uh, lime today is around $40 a ton, so just the savings right there, just on the cover, and. All the other benefits from it is huge. I want to tell you a story that is about hope. The hope that soils can improve, that farmers can thrive and prosper from improved soils in this and the next generation. This is a story of farms, science, and the farmers who became farmer scientists. It just it's brought back excitement on the farm, okay? It, it just, I mean, it was just a time of learning and this grants allowed us to do that. I reckon you never get too old to learn. No, you never, know? never. <laughs> What everyone did was take a field. Um, you know, five different growers, uh, everybody picked out one field. And the field that we picked out was, I thought was pretty unique. It had some clay, some eroded clay hill in it that would always get as hard as a rock when, even though we've been no-tilling for 15 years, uh, we had some bottom land in it that would hold water and, and drown. And, and we had some good land in it. I thought it was a really good variation of what we experienced on our farm. So I, I, you know, in my mind, if, if we could change the characteristics of that soil, we could do it on our whole farm. For three years, these farmers ensured that when a cash crop was not growing, they had a multi-species cover crop on the ground, and the result was no fallow and loads of diversity. Everyone had a slightly different experience with that first cover crop. It, it, it was very big, we were very nervous. We planted into it green. I planted corn, if I remember. It scared me because we had never planted anything that big. But I uh, had a great stand of corn. 
had my neighbor to come by and wonder what in the blank was I doing. We had never, I guess, aggressively looked at cover crop, planting them early on time and letting them go for maximum height, maximum mass. So, so it's a real experience. You know. After the first year of, of having cover, we were, I was still kind of close, all right, I'm planting covers now, now what? This Conservation Innovative Grant was crucial. Really, it was really crucial. I just needed questions answered. We, we needed to know something. I mean, we, was this going to really work down in the south? Or, you know, we were a lot of times been told, you know, you can't increase organic matter in the south for one thing. Sunny Price's field had a beautiful legume heavy cover crop. In this field, we used three different rates of nitrogen for his cotton that included a check strip of no nitrogen at all. So when we get, went to harvest, that was the amazing thing. We, where I had the 90 units, my standard rate of in, it picked 1,028 pounds of cotton. I think where the 55 units was at, picked 1,143 pounds of cotton. And then the check uh, with zero nitrogen picked 928 pounds. Uh, we had a weigh wagon out there, so uh, we got pretty accurate weights and checked it that way. That's the way we checked it. Well, we put no nitrogen the whole year that, that cotton still picked 928 pounds. And so it was, that was pretty amazing to me. While our initial focus was on nitrogen, we noticed a number of unexpected soil test results that seemed to be consistent across all CIG fields. It was time to get soil samples checked. And like I say, I was using a, uh, another consultant to check my samples for me and did my rec soil recommendations. But what caught my eye was when he sent that map, that SIG field, that 12 acre SIG field sitting there, every grid on it had zero, called for zero pounds of lime. And I didn't know, I was, I was shocked. I said, well, we must have missed something. We must have put lime out here last year and just miscalculated one. So we went back on the records and looked back in my records and all, and we, 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 you know, we hadn't put no lime out. That was really something very interesting, very exciting, because then I knew, hey, if I can save cost here, then we begin to have some information about, that I could share with other guys, hey, we can make these covers work. Sonny's findings after one year were eye-popping, but something unexpected and spectacular really was happening across all five of our fields. The most excitement was in the organic matter. You know, we were always told we couldn't change our organic matter. I and mean, here we were starting out, hadn't had any tillage going on on my farm, strip till, but we weren't full tillage, disc in the fields, and the organic matter had been staying the same. And I guess people were right. We, we couldn't change our organic matter until we started with the cover crop. And we started getting our numbers back. And instead of our, our P and K levels dropping like you know you would normally see, or see a pH going down after a corn crop, it stayed steady. Uh, we, we got super excited. I got super excited. You know, I said if this thing will work on, on this sig plot, I wanted to plot some of my own land in, in, a, in a bigger kind of way. Undoubtedly, the principles are the same no matter where you are. It's a matter of making it work for you and where you're at and, and having the right mindset. You know, not only was it on my farm, it was on four other farms, and, and everything we were seeing were mirroring one another. And I got to talking about this to some people, and the guy said, um, well, how did the check do? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, you're telling me about what's happening here, and he said, how's the check? I said, well, we didn't have a check. We just treated the whole field the same, five different fields, five different farmers, and, you know, everybody's doing the exact same thing, and we're comparing the results. Well, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's no good. I mean, that's, that's no research. And, and I, I got to thinking about that thing and, and talking to Buzz about it. And you know, I was questioning, well, what kind of work do we need to do that someone couldn't say that again? You know, replicate this work in such a fashion that when we, we talk to someone, they couldn't say, 
well, you know, what about so-and-so? Or, or, or why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you do that? And, and that was the idea of a randomized, replicated fertilizer study. Carl chose a site where we could locate our plots. We designed this with four fertilizer treatments that we replicated five times. And then we ran the setup in two concurrent experiments. The plots were 60 foot by 100 foot because we had to use Carl's equipment to plant, treat, and harvest our plots. We planted our first wheat crop into a summer cover. Uh, we're talking about uh, summer cover that had been killed by frost. It was about chest high, and we had a roller on the front of our tractor rolling down the cover as we pulled our grain drill through it. And again, people that thought they were driving by just thought we lost our mind. It was almost unbelievable how easy the land was. It opened up easy with the front blades, it closed back, good seed soil contact. It did really well, and um, the, the, the planting wasn't, wasn't an issue. While Carl planted, fertilized, and top dressed the wheat plots, I was out there with my team of students sampling and watching. The big issue that year was that we had head scab. It dramatically affected not only my wheat, but everybody else's wheat. It didn't matter the production system, it didn't matter if they were no-till conventional, it didn't matter cover crop, no cover crop, everybody had head scab. Our wheat crop was hurt just like everybody else's. The, the, the cool thing about that was because of things we'd implemented on our own farm, our inputs were so much less. Uh, we were basically at a 38 bushel break-even cost and my neighbors were at about a 65 bushel break-even cost. And I attribute all that to cover crops. If somebody had told me four years ago that I'd have been out walking across my field with a shovel in my hand digging up for earthworms and I weren't going fishing, you know, <laughs> I, I'd have told them they were crazy, you know. But uh, so, so, yeah, it's changed. It's yeah. changed me in a lot of ways. In June of 2015, we harvested our first wheat crop from the plots. Results for wheat response to nitrogen were predictable, although it was interesting to see how much wheat we made behind the cover crops with zero fertilizer. But here was our surprise. We saw no response for potassium fertilizer in a medium soil test rating. This result was confusing. We always understood that potassium rapidly leaches from our sandy coastal plain soils. So applying fertility recommendations was the minimum you wanted to do if you didn't want your crop to run out of potassium. How could we be so far off? This was only our first crop and since we were rookies at this, maybe we were making some sort of mistake. In South Carolina, with soybeans double cropped behind wheat, all our fertilizer goes in front of the wheat. This is practical and it sure seemed logical to us. But while we watched the crop grow, it was really difficult to tell the difference between the plots. After the soybean harvest, we noticed that predictably in front of the wheat, nitrogen made no difference. But we were shocked to see that the soybeans, like the wheat before it, did not respond to the potassium fertilizer. We began to wonder if our results actually might be valid. By the end of 2015, we had two crops with decent production where 30 out of the 40 plots had not seen anything except nitrogen fertilizer. Surely we were running out of fertilizer at this time and the corn crop would tell on us. Our 2016 corn yield results showed a predictable response to nitrogen just like the wheat in 2015. Simple economics told us that at least in the range that we tested, the more nitrogen applied, the better the economic return. No real surprises there. What was interesting was that we saw an impressive 117 bushel yield from 50 units of nitrogen and no other fertilizer. In some years on the coastal plain, a farmer would be quite happy with that yield. Once again, there was no yield response in a medium rated sandy soil to fertilizer potassium. This was the third crop in a row in the same plots where fertilizer potassium did not induce a yield response. 
What we initially saw as a perplexing anomaly was beginning to settle down into a somewhat predictable pattern. If we fast forward to the end of 2017, we had harvested five crops from the fertilizer plots. Not surprisingly, we noticed that the two wheat crops and the corn crop responded to nitrogen fertilizer, while the two soybean crops did not. The more surprising pattern that emerged was the recommended potassium fertilizer had no effect on the yield for all five crops that we grew. 2017 was a phenomenal year for our soybeans, and if you were going to see nutrient deficiencies show up, it should have been here. In addition, November 2017 was the third year that we had not applied any phosphorus fertilizer to any one of the plots because soil test P was high. One has to ask whether the lack of phosphorus and potassium fertilizer over the three years hurt our yields against county averages. We'll let the yields speak for themselves. This did not look like a soil in decline, but what did the soil tests say? For all practical purposes, pHs have stayed the same despite zero lime addition. Phosphorus has declined in this period, but soil test ratings are still in the high or sufficient range. Soil test potassium has remained steady for all treatments despite hefty grain removal rates and remember that only one treatment received potassium fertilizer. These results are definitely the ones that strain the credulity of our audience. Yet, as Carl would say, they are what they are. And we're so dependent upon the soil. Uh, um, it's a beautiful thing to see all this coming together and working. Yes. And I think it's an exciting time. And I, I really look forward to seeing what lies ahead. Yes. The narrative is, the more fertilizer you put, the better yield you're gonna make. Money in the bank. And, and that's just what we've been told. I'd like to circle back to the original CIG that we began in 2013. These data really seem to subvert the standard narrative on fertilizer that our farmers receive. I just don't see anything in the trends that would alarm me. Now 10 of these sample zones did receive manure at least once in the last four and a half years. Carl's field, however, hasn't seen any lime or synthetics, except nitrogen of course, or manure in that same period. Yet his results reflect what we saw in the other fields. And, uh, and we quit cold turkey. You know, in the past we always used granule fertilizer and we used chicken litter and we were using a whole lot more nitrogen. On all these fields that I've had cover in, we've cut the granule fertilizer completely out. You know, this was a crazy talk five years ago. And more people are starting to realize, you know, dang, they're cutting back this much on fertilizer, seeing the same, same yields. You know, we're not increasing our yields, we're maintaining the same yields with less input, and that's where we're saving our money. I've got 100% coverage now. I've cover crop every acre. We, we grow about 6,300 acres, uh, 10 to that much, uh, but we see the importance and the change. So, so we got covers planted on everything. Very comfortable about planting a crop now without phosphorus or potash at all. <laughs> I just, and that's a big money save. There's, there's my money. I now see cover crops as rather than an added expense as a systems approach that is affecting everything else that we do that our fertilizer costs are down a minimum of 80%, which is huge. Not only are you becoming a better producer and eliminating a lot of your cost, but you're doing it in a, in a way that is, is, I think, friendly to the environment. And when you leave things alone, it seems that things come back into balance better. So uh, it's, it's been a reward both ways, not only financially, but the way that I do things and the way that we approach things on the farm, it makes me feel better about what I'm doing. I think a farmer scientist is somebody who has awoken to the possibilities that 
his or her soils are living dynamic ecosystems that he or she has the ability to change those soils through management and has finally come to the point where they can test things out for themselves and not necessarily trust the word of an expert who may have done something five or six states over. And I think the farmer says, hang on, you know, that's all well and good, but I need to make a living out of this, not this year, but next year and the year after that. And a lot of this has been not what we need, really need to change, is what we don't need to do anymore. Uh, we don't need to overapply. We're, we're maintaining levels and cutting back every year. Understanding that it's not you have to do this one practice, but it's being able to say these are the principles that we need to apply. Minimum disturbance, physical, chemical, and biological disturbance, beginning with reducing our tillage. Keeping the soil covered with either a residue or a canopy. Keep a live root in the soil year round. So when you don't have a cash crop, have a cover crop in the soil. Number four is diversity, diversity, diversity. My rule of thumb is try and have more than 15 species over a three year period in the field and you will see a remarkable difference especially in, in the, the soil's ability to recycle nutrients and to infiltrate and hold water. My whole farming life has been about spending more money to try to make more yield. You know, cover crops is about reducing your inputs and not having to make as much, not having to hit that home run to be able to get your money back. With the soil health movement, the, the farmer is becoming much more esteemed, much more of a, 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 an authority on what is going on on his or her farm. So some of the first steps that you can take is experiment yourself, experiment with diversity. Take that two acre field that nobody sees, plant cover crops and see what happens. And we still got some more challenges to face, I think. Yes. But like I say, that makes to us <laughs> life exciting. That's right. Anthony, sure does. Sure does.